Uh, we're in Luke 13. Uh, we want to look this morning at the teaching and really the exhortations of Jesus found a little past the midway point of the chapter. Uh, this will be the third lesson out of four uh, coming from this 13th chapter. You know, studying the gospel as we do, taking our turn every two weeks as the Lord allows and breaking it down in these what I would call digestible portions uh, so that we can do justice to the, the passages of Scripture. But we threaten ourselves with losing um, sight of the big picture. And the picture we're presented with is something like a traveling caravan uh, within which we find the Lord Jesus moving along with his disciples from one locale to another, uh, engaging with different crowds, <laughs> of people along the way and with the increasing antagonisms of his enemies trailing after him. But Luke reminds us in our passage this morning, you see there in, in 22, that's where we're going to begin, uh, the almost foreboding significance of his destination. He is passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem and the events which will take place there are never far from our Lord's mind, if they ever escape him at all. Uh, that is the goal and the completion of his mission which will take place there. And it is the constant reminder that his life and work are aimed at the most profound consequence, the very destinies of the men and women to whom he has come. And that will come through in force in these verses we studied today. So let's, so let's read the passage. Uh, we're actually going to read two passages this morning, uh, verses 22 through 30 out of Luke 13, and then look uh, at a passage from uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up, so, he, he, so you see he brings an illustration here. Uh, once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, well, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God but yourselves being thrown out. And they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. And then if you'll turn over to Matthew chapter seven, a similar passage and very familiar to you. We'll read a few verses there. If you're there, Matthew seven, uh, verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And then move down to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Our lesson today is what I would call evangelistic. In fact, I insist to call it evangelistic because 
Our text is evangelistic. It is characterized, first of all, by exhortation uh, in the commands Jesus gives to strive and to seek. Also by warning, a door locked and impassable, uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth, exclusion, by promised blessing, a great feast in God's kingdom, and by shocking surprises, both wonderful and tragic. We might also say it's characterized by apparent contradiction. Uh, John 6, 44 uh, contains words from Jesus. We often quote here at Believer's Chapel, John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And yet here we find Jesus issuing a call for earnest striving on the part of men and women. And this, in the passage out of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which we read, he avowed that the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And yet that demands to be interpreted against the multiple statements by God that his kingdom will be filled with as many people as the sand of the seashore, as the stars in the heavens. Well, Luke sets the scene in verses 22 and 23 as Jesus and his disciples continue on their way to Jerusalem. Uh, someone in the crowd spoke to him, uh, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? People today tend to disparage that formulation, being saved, or you saved, they mock us. But everyone here knew what he meant. It was entrance into the promised kingdom and the certainty of eternal life that was behind his question. We're not told what led to it. How did this question burst out of the man's uh, mouth? Uh, perhaps he had... Uh, th uh, this man who posed the question had been following along for a while and had heard uh, the demanding requirements the Lord seemed to lay out for entrance into the kingdom. Uh, how hearts had to be of uh, the right stuff, like, like good soil. And worldly desires needed to be put down. Uh, the demand for constant readiness if one was to enter in. And the seemingly severe insistence on repentance uh, who could meet these demands, he perhaps was wondering. Surely there'd only be a few. More likely, however, the question arose out of proud and complacent satisfaction with his own heritage as a Jew, what one writer described as a pluming of himself on belonging to such an exclusive circle. There's evidence that the subject of how many will be saved was a topic of discussion among the rabbis, the consensus winning out that all Jews but for the very worse would be saved in the end. And thus the self-satisfied question, if I can paraphrase it, are there just us few who are being saved? Well, you'll notice the Lord chose not to answer the question Instead, he issued a pointed challenge in verse 24. Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. He wished to clear up immediately any false expectations the man uh, must have had. He was wasting his time speculating about the arithmetic of the kingdom. His time would be better spent uh, seeing that this figurative door that admits entrance into salvation was not wide, but in fact narrow, uh, being sure that he himself was doing all that he could do to be found as one of those able to enter in, to use Jesus' actual language. He had put it more expansively in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. 
It would not be exactly to correct to say that this was a favorite theme of Jesus. It was more of a critical truth he held. In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, that familiar passage in which our Lord uh, describes himself in various ways as the Good Shepherd, who so completely uh, gathers his sheep into the fold and, and feeds them and protects them, calls them, and ultimately lays down his life for his sheep. He does indeed describe himself as the shepherd of a specific flock of sheep who belong to one fold and who hear his voice and follow him. Of all the sheep in the pasture, they uniquely belong to him. But he also identifies himself as the door into the fold of his sheep. In other words, in the figure, he is the gate through which sheep, through which his sheep, again, who belong to him, no other sheep, enter into the safety of his care. And so secure are they with him as they follow him, he gives eternal life to them and they never perish and no one can snatch them out of his hand. He saves them, uh, to use uh, the questioner's language in Luke 13, because they belong to him and they enter into his fold through him. On another time, uh, later, when the Lord was explaining to his disciples the atoning sacrifice he was to endure on their behalf, and in response to their subsequent uh, troubled and sorrowful hearts, he described his father's house in heaven with its many dwelling places, and he promised them that he was going to prepare a place for them and would come again and receive them uh, to himself so that where he was, they would be also. And he told them, you know the way I am going. And Thomas objected, you know all this, it's a familiar story. Thomas objected, Lord, we don't know. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Well, here in Luke 13, uh, when Jesus answered the questioner with the exhortation to strive to enter through the narrow door, he was referencing himself as the only way. He is the narrow door. There was a revealing photo in Friday's print edition of the Wall Street Journal. The headline was, In Nepal, in Nepal, a host of deities play host to adoring worshipers. And the photo uh, pictured lined up in a row, an endless parade of upright, uh, colorfully decorated, paper mache like figures, no two alike, but each uh, decorated in lavish adornment. While before them were the worshipers, uh, some standing in adoration, others on the floor uh, before them, offering their every five year gestures of worship as they gazed up into the empty eyes of the figures. You could picture uh, the row of manufactured gods extending really in the photo beyond view. I studied the photo and examined uh, the features, not of the gods, but of the worshipers. Uh, they were clearly enjoying themselves. And I wondered, did they find their favorite one and, and choose to turn their attention to that one because of its appeal to them by its peculiar features? Or were they arranged by some sort of tribal uh, distinction, which one of the deities they were to worship? Uh, but you couldn't help but think that they had selected the one before them at their arrival. And if that one had not been there, they would have effortlessly chosen one of the others down the row. Jesus is not a manufactured God. He is true God, having taken on a human nature. He became like one of us in order to save us from ourselves. He came to call his sheep to him and in the process to die for them. 
For his sheep were wandering and drowning in their sin and deserving of God's wrath and of his hell. They could not find the narrow door. They didn't even know there was one. But he himself was the sinless one, uh, both God and man. And therefore, when he would voluntarily lay down his life for his sheep, his death would serve as the death that they deserved. And the life that he would live would become their life, for he died in their place. He died only for them, and they would enter through the gate that was the good shepherd himself, and there they would find pasture for their souls. Jesus said, the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. But that really emphasizes uh, the Godward perspective, if I can use that phrase, what is existentially true but hidden from so many. Uh, here the Lord exhorts and warns the man and all those like him to understand his dire condition apart from that narrow road and to address themselves earnestly to their own salvation. They are to strive to enter through the narrow road. We can't miss that. They are to strive to enter through the narrow road. This is the evangelist's call. Uh, beckoning the dead to life, the blind to sight, the unable to exertion. It appears to the unbelieving world, and indeed even the poorly trained believer, a blatant contradiction, a logical absurdity. How can the dead respond? Uh, how can the blind uh, see if sinners are dead in their trespasses and sins and are unable to come to God or strive to enter through the narrow door? How is it that Jesus responds in this way? But this is the general call of God. Uh, the one that is issued to all. Strive, come, believe. The call goes forth indiscriminately. God commands the impossible and then gives grace to fulfill his command. He's pictured, it's pictured in Jesus' healing of the man with the withered hand, which Luke recorded in his sixth chapter. You, you remember the man's right hand was, was withered. He was unable to use it. I'll put mine down. He was unable to use it or, or move it. And yet Jesus uh, called him forth out of the synagogue assembly and in front of all those assembled there, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man did so. He did the impossible and his hand was restored. It was the idea that Paul, you know, Paul, the apostle of grace, had in mind when he wrote to the Philippian believers in Philippians 2 verse 12 to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. The fear and trembling uh, reflected the immense importance of the striving for salvation the apostle wanted to impress upon them, but the logical sense of it came immediately following, as you know, uh, they would be able to work out their salvation only because it was God who was at work within them, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. The general call is issued to all. Strive, come, believe. God graciously extends it and encourages his own to broadly issue it themselves. He calls us ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, begging the world on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God, to strive to enter through the narrow door. But the individual call, the one that is empowered by God and is effectual, is the invisible one. It is the call that transforms the impossible into the inevitable. It is what led our Lord in John chapter 6 to insist that all the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will not cast out. Their striving will by divine power prove effectual, and they will enter the narrow door. And as we focus now on Jesus' words here in Luke, back to Luke 13, 
uh, we're led to understand from verse 29, if you'll skip forward a bit, we're to understand that through that narrow door is the unique and marvelous banquet hall of the Messiah King in which those who thus enter will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. The man who posed the question seems to have assumed he was saved and somehow earned entry into that sweet reward, but Jesus would have him know that the way is narrow that leads to it, as is the door that enters into it. Therefore, one must strive to enter through it. The word the Lord used to strive is the Greek agonizomai. It's a word from which we get our words agony and, and agonize. It points to the effort that comes from great desire. It is sin. Remember, this is an evangelistic passage. It's an evangelistic message. It is sin that restrains you from entering the narrow door. So put off sin. Now you're responsible uh, to do it. You are not innocent. God has made himself known to you in creation, in nature, in the hidden recesses of your consciousness, and he calls you to strive earnestly to know him and enter into an intimate relationship with him. It will inevitably seem difficult because of our natural love for the pleasures of sin and because of our stubborn pride. But those who will be saved are those who earnestly seek after it. Jesus said it in chapter 16. In verse 16, he had come into the world, and since that time, he said, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. James Boyce told the story of a woman who once sat in a pew at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia when Donald Gray Barnhouse was their pastor. Barnhouse was preaching on the cross that day. Uh, the woman was not a Christian. She had not yet trusted in Christ for salvation and entered through the narrow door. And as <clears throat> Barnhouse spoke, he said, imagine that the cross is a door uh, all you are asked to do is to go through. On one side, the side facing you, uh, there's an invitation. Whoever will may come. You stand there with your sin upon you, and you wonder if you should enter or not. And finally, you do. And as you do, the burden of your sin drops away. You're safe. You're free. Uh, joyfully, you then turn around and see written, on the backside of the cross through which you've now entered the words chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Barnhouse invited those who are listening to enter. And the woman later said it was the first time in her life she really understood what it meant to be a Christian and that in understanding it, she had believed. And at that very moment, she had entered the door Moreover, her life then bore witness to the fact that a great change had occurred and she was God's child. And Boyce concluded his account by saying, I am certain of the facts of my story because that woman is my mother. Every believer's story is different. Were we to go around the room today and listen to each testimony present here today, all would include some level of striving. Some, only a little, you were saved as a child. Others, a massive striving. Some, through terrible trials. Alexander McLaren wrote, we are not saved by effort, but we shall not be, believe without effort. We must agonize if we are to enter in. And all who do enter in are saved and enjoy the promised rewards, exchanging their striving for the awe of knowing that the Lord was holding your hand all the way, leading you through the door, and of finding that all along your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
Well, alas, there is a time limit on the offer of salvation. The door is open now. You are alive. You have your mind. And those who agonize now over their souls uh, will enter. If they but seek, they will find. The door will be opened uh, to them. And there's never any indication in the Bible that those who truly seek after God will be turned away or excluded from God's family and his kingdom. But here Jesus immediately adds in verse 25, For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So we understand that there is a divine time clock. And the many are those who try to make their decision too late. And there are many, uh, to borrow Jesus' words from Matthew 7, because they chose the broad way that leads uh, to destruction. The road was roomy uh, they had chosen for themselves. It was the popular choice. Uh, there seemed little shame in taking it, while the other way was far less popular and seemed to carry with it the risk of mockery and deprivation, the loss of freedom, uh, the burden of duties. The many appear in that ultimate period of a person's existence when it's too late. Only then do they long for what they cannot have. I know I referenced it in a previous lesson not too long ago, but this is the same pathetic situation we observed earlier in the chapter when we illustrated it with the experience of the rich man in Luke chapter 16 who, who died, who was buried, and he's seen in Hades uh, being in torment and then somehow eyeing the formerly poor man, Lazarus, enjoying the pleasures of heaven in Abraham's bosom. And the rich man cried out for mercy from Abraham for just one more opportunity now that he could see the ultimate tragedy that had come upon him. But Abraham told him in so many words, you had your chance. The truth is the period of opportunity is limited by the imminence of judgment. The broad way leads only to destruction. I'm reading Jesus' words carefully in verses 24 and 25, uh, the many won't be able to enter in because the door has been shut. That's the point of the Lord's illustration in verse 25 of the prudent homeowner who at the appointed time uh, gets up and shuts the door. And we, we find it is shut irrevocably because all those who had dismissed his hospitality until too late only then began to seek entry. Uh, standing outside, a, a key word, standing outside and knocking on the door saying, Lord, open up to us. But he refused them for the door had been shut in a definitive way. And if you were not already in, you were out. They could bang on the door all they wanted. It was too late. Because no matter how much they protested that they had actually been his very good friends, recalling all sorts of memorable moments that they had had with him, he denied they had any relationship at all. And worse, he knew them to be evildoers. Not only would he not allow them in, but he demanded that they depart from him. And notice there are only two places, only two, inside the narrow door and sadly outside. If a person does not strive and do what is necessary to gain entry through the narrow door and into the banquet hall of the Lord, he can only be consigned to one other place. And in that place, Jesus says in verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. Here is the promise, gloom of false profession. Twice the master inside the house denied he knew them, twice. They protested. They had eaten and drank with him. They'd been around when he taught in their streets. 
But he said, I don't even know where you are from. In other words, I don't acknowledge you. 2 Timothy 2, 19 declares, The firm foundation of God stands, having this sealed, the Lord knows those who are his. That's a promise uh, with a warning uh, behind it. He also knows those who are not his. The person in the crowd who had forced his question upon the Lord met with a pointed response. Don't worry about how many are saved. Be certain that you have entered into salvation. Hell is real. And no one believed it more than the Lord Jesus Christ. He spoke of hell more than any of the biblical authors. Hell is the backdrop of the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, Jesus describes in verse 28, as those left out of the kingdom uh, tragically realize the blessings of heaven that they neglected. I said this passage is an evangelistic passage. Uh, evangelism practice accurately offers the good news of salvation in Christ, the forgiveness of sins, but it also frankly contrasts it with the miserable suffering of hell. Uh, people will walk a football field's length over hot coals rather than speak about hell. It's quite possibly the most avoided topic of conversation there, there is, but it is real. Pope, Pope Francis was recently asked in an interview at, just a week or so ago how he imagines hell if he re really believes in God's forgiveness. It's difficult to imagine it, he replied. What I would say is it is what I would say is not a dogma of faith, but my personal thought. I like to think hell is empty. I hope it is. There's much we could say about the Pope's uh, response. For one, it's a relief. He finds that he finds what are his personal thoughts to not be a dogma of faith. Uh, but his ignorance about hell is quite alarming. Uh, what one hopes about hell is irrelevant uh, to the reality of its existence. Listen, I don't like <laughs> talking about hell. It's, this is what's here, so that's why we're, we're talking about it. So what one hopes about hell is relevant. It's irrelevant to the reality of its existence. That's not to say that the topic is pleasant. Uh, the Pope is correct, I think, in saying it is difficult uh, to imagine it. Any right-minded and generous person would find the prospect of anyone enduring hell a revolting thing and, and troublesome to dwell on. Some excellent faithful scholars have been so troubled by the thought of it that they've gone to lengths to diminish its fearsomeness with notions of annihilation in this in the sword, finally ending the agony of hell. But Jesus meant his answer to the questioner to be a warning uh, and encouragement to avoid the horrors of hell. Part of the agony of it will be the terrible ability to see all those you may have thought were headed to the same sublime destiny as you, enjoying the blessings of God's kingdom while you find yourself forcibly thrust out. The final verses of the passage remind us of the setting of our scene. Jesus was born a Jew. He had come to be the Jews' promised Messiah. Almost all the crowd following after him were Jews, most certainly the questioner himself. They were the chosen people. They knew it, and they assumed certain privileges that were theirs because of their heritage. So it had to have been especially difficult to hear Jesus speak of look, looking upon the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the famed prophets of old, enjoying uh, the promised rewards. These people all thought would be theirs, but hearing now of the possibility of being excluded from their company. Not just excluded, 
it seems, but thrown out, revealing the emptiness of their counterfeit identity and the sad delusion of all their dreams. But worse, perhaps, was the surprising picture Jesus held before the imposters, revealing that Gentiles would be welcomed even before them, and they, they would be the king's guests at this future messianic banquet. They will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Yes, some whom they had always considered last will by grace be first. And some whom they presumed would be first would be relegated to the last. They could only have been astounded. Grace always astounds. At another place in the Gospels, Jesus' disciples were astounded when they heard Jesus say that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. And Jesus responded, you know, with people, this is impossible, with God, but with God, all things are possible. The door may be narrow, but God is able to bring his own through it and into the joy of a relationship with him. That is God's grace in action. Men and women cannot draw themselves uh, to God or enter through the narrow door on our own, but he calls all to strive, uh, strive to enter in. God honors such. And once through the narrow door and into God's kingdom, we discover, uh, mysteriously perhaps, it was his grace all along drawing us straight through. The answer to the question, are they few who are saved, is no. God's grace is shepherding the many through to glory. Aren't you happy to be in that company? I am. Lord, thank you uh, for uh, giving us a way to forgiveness, a way into the banquet hall of the kingdom to dine with you and have fellowship with you. We confess corporately our class now that we're not worthy. We could not have gone through that door uh, no matter how much we strive, were it not for you uh, making us uh, righteous because of Christ and bringing us, drawing us to yourself. No one could come unless you drew, drew us. And you, in sovereign grace, did that. Thank you for uh, this, such great salvation that provides not just uh, the forgiveness, not just the atoning sacrifice, but the grace of repentance, conversion, and belief. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.